Hey guys, this is Ramesh. Welcome to my channel, Stopping the World. Hope you guys are doing well. Now, a few years ago, I read this amazing book called The Magus of Strovolos. And in this book, the author spoke of a mystic who lived on the island of Cyprus, who was capable of some amazing feats. Like he could look at people and diagnose illnesses heal people of diseases miraculously. He was able to travel out of his body and visit other worlds, talk to beings. He was able to see things which are far away, events that are happening at far away places. And more than just being a mystic and a healer, he was also a spiritual teacher. And uh, they fondly called him uh, Daskalos, which in Greek means guru or teacher. And the author of the book, a sociology professor at the University of Maine, spent a lot of time, many years, closely associated with him and this group of people uh, in Cyprus, and closely observed uh, firsthand uh, these, these miracles happening. And he wrote a series of books documenting these, beginning, of course, with the Magus of Strovolos and then there's a homage to the sun and there's a fire in the heart, which is my personal favorite. And for me, what was really amazing was that the terms used by these people in their philosophy was so similar and so familiar to Hinduism and Buddhism. You know, they used words like karma and reincarnation and energy bodies and things like this. Uh, it's amazing because these people come from a very strong Greek Orthodox Christianity background. Which, if you look it up, is very interesting because it's, it's different to the mainstream Christianity that you will see in the world these days. Nevertheless, so I had a chance to talk uh, to the author of, this, of these best-selling books, which in case if you're interested, I'll put a link um, in the description below. You can check out. So I had a chance to talk to the author, Dr. Kiriakos Markides, uh, on his whole experience with these people and his journey and how his outlook on life was changed. And um, I hope you guys really enjoy this interview. And if you do, please subscribe uh, to the channel. Um, like and share the video as much as you want. And uh, see you soon. Professor uh, Kiriakos Markides, thank you so much for uh, joining me on the channel. It's a great uh, pleasure. I have read um, uh, at least two of, your, two of your books fully, and the other one um, I've, I've skimmed through it. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of the Magus of Strovolos and, and the Fire in the Heart. And, and I have recently started going through Homage to the Sun as well. So it's, it's a great privilege to have you on the channel. So thank you so much for being here. And how are you doing today? Thank you, Ramesh, for inviting me. It's my pleasure. I'm doing fine. <laughs> Great. So I want to jump right into the into the subject. So you you had these amazing experiences with these um, uh, mystics and healers in, in Cyprus. But so you have an academic background. So you are someone who is trained to be skeptical and think scientifically. Right. So yes. how can you tell us briefly how did this all begin for you? Like how did you make that? leap of faith how did you get into this whole thing how did this happen it it was the result of uh, a um, a process of opening up to those possibilities uh by the time i got my doctoral degree at the university uh, at the university in the united states uh, i be i was a thorough agnostic because i thought that was the only way i can uh, i can uh, i can see the world and when I went to the University of Maine, a colleague of mine introduced me to transcendental meditation, oh, nice. which came out of which came out of India. Right. Uh, and as a result of that, I began reading in uh, in Eastern about Eastern religions, uh, the new science that was opening up possibilities for spirituality in our understanding of reality. 
Right. So it was that was during the 70s uh, okay. when I began to re-examine my own agnosticism, right? right? And I was about to have my first sabbatical in the late 90s, and I was planning on writing a book on international terrorism. Right. That was my training in political sociology. Right. And I accidentally met a friend in downtown Nicosia that I hadn't seen for about 10 years or so, who uh, 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 introduced me uh, to this healer that only lived uh, two miles from my house, but I never met. So I thought that uh, that was very interesting. And that was uh, a time when I was, I was reading about shamans, about uh, American medicine men. And then I, I said, I'd, I'd like to meet him because I, I found it very interesting that here is a, a principal of a high school who is involved with things that uh, normally are, are, are not part of the mainstream of our uh, knowledge and understanding. And when I met him, I, um, I was very impressed with his intelligence. And also I was very impressed with what I heard about him by people who knew him intimately. Right. So I decided to uh, give up temporarily, at least at the time, my project on terrorism and focus on studying Daskalos. And he gave me the okay after a lot of uh, question marks in my mind about it. Um, I was wondering whether this would be accepted as legitimate academic work. But at that time, uh, there was a, a developing field within uh, the social sciences, uh, the phenomenology, meaning that when you are confronted with a reality that is very different than yours, uh, don't try to impose your own categories on that reality. Just try to understand it from within their um, uh, conceptual awareness. So. I, de I decided to become an observer, a participant observer in, in Daskalo circles. And I witnessed some very unusual phenomena, um, healing phenomena, uh, abilities that he had that I could not explain rationally. Uh, in other words, uh, clairvoyant uh, um, abilities to tell me how a woman, uh, what, what kind of a problem a woman had 2, 000, uh, 7 7,000 miles away in New York. And uh, to me, those things were very shocking because they didn't make sense. Right. So as I proceeded to go on into the, the study, I realized that we as human beings have hidden potentials, hidden abilities that some individuals like Daskalos bring to the surface. Right. And, uh, and that of course, uh, relates also to the worldview that goes beyond materialism. Right. So it was encountering Daskalos was an introduction into a worldview that went contrary to the reductionist materialist worldview that dominate, uh, dominates academia. Right. And I felt that I was, uh, I was on, on, on safe ground in reference to reality. And I felt uh, that I was ready to give up my... Um, to give up my uh, status as an academic if I am to bring that out. It wasn't, I was not brave. It's just that I had tenure and I was not afraid to be fired, right? right? <laughs> so uh, I went into this field and I spent 10 years studying him. I, uh, I wrote three books about Daskalos. Uh, and uh, uh, what, uh, what was interesting after I wrote those books, number one, my colleagues accepted my work as legitimate um, ethnography. Right. Uh, so I, I didn't suffer any negative consequences because I went into this field. I was not trying to proselytize or to convince anybody. Right. I simply recorded what I experienced and I wanted to let my readers make their own minds right. about what to do with this material. Well, interestingly enough, I started getting letters and uh, contacts uh, both in my office and through mail and email now 
of people who told me that they live in those realities. Wow. And that Daskalos offered a worldview, a map of reality that was very meaningful to them. Right. So Daskalos was not only able to have those abilities, but also he had a worldview, a map that could help people on the way. Right. Um, the, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, so you mentioned that it was it did not have a negative impact on your academic uh, uh, standing right. or whatever, like you mentioned. But how did your peers back home, you know, who haven't directly experienced this, how did they receive it? Like, did it help change their minds, or is there a sense of incredulity in them? Or well, uh, those people who were ready like me uh, to open up to those possibilities, they opened up. The others accepted it as simply field research, right. like an anthropologist who goes into a tribe and studying it from within. But yes, there was uh, there were a couple of people that were affected with the work that I've done personally. And those who are not affected, they did not... Uh, consider me a charlatan or anything like that. Um, they accepted my work as mainstream academic work as a form of legitimate ethnography. Right. So as a, cons as a natural consequence of that, were there attempts made by any other academic from some other field to test these under laboratory conditions as it were? Did someone say, okay, let me go there with a with all the instrument and see what's going on and brainwave, did something like that happen? Or well, I mean, I um, I've met a lot of people who are doing that kind of research, right. and th these are people who are working on the marching. Even in uh, top universities, uh, Ivy League universities in the country, uh, who um, uh, have done this kind of uh, of research, and they have come to the conclusions that I have. Uh, concluded in the field, but they were uh, doing their studies under experimental conditions. Uh, Charlie Ta uh, Tark, for example, some uh, psychologists. Um, I, I've met, uh, I, I, I participated in the setting up of the Office of Alternative Therapies oh, nice. at the National Institute of Health. And there I met people who were working in that field people in medicine, people even in engineering, believe it or not. Wow. Who were, so uh, I also met an, uh, uh, a couple of anthropologists who were, uh, had similar experiences in the field, like Michael Harner, for example, at uh, the New School of Social Research. So I felt very comfortable academically that I was on the right path. And the problem was not with me, but rather the reductionistic uh, uh, conditioning of most academia. Right. And and I would just quickly touch upon the religious background uh, here, because for me, coming from India and most readers who would come from, uh, from, from, you know, from a background of Eastern mysticism, like you have frequently mentioned, I yeah. see a lot of points of overlap, a lot of concepts like karma and reincarnation and chakras and, and you know, energy bodies. These are not concepts that at least here, people usually associate with Christianity. And of course, this is, uh, so these mystics, they belong to a very specific strain, uh, like Greek Orthodox Christianity. So can you tell us how religion plays a role here? And if these aspects are part of, or accepted by Greek Orthodox Christianity, or is this, was it just appropriated by these mystics from a different it was not, uh, it is not accepted by mainstream Orthodox Christianity. You, you mentioned reincarnation. That's a taboo in the context of the Eastern Orthodox Church or Christianity in general. Right. Um, now, one, I, I can say, for example, that from the point of view of science, you can mention, you can say that uh, surveys show that 25% of Christians believe in reincarnation. Uh, based on uh, surveys uh, and based on the research of Ian Stevenson um, on his research with little kids, 1,500 of them uh, who claim they remember past lives. These are facts. They are not, it doesn't necessarily mean that there is such a thing as reincarnation. So I can safely say, what are the facts about it? 
that there are Christians who claim they remember past lives. But that doesn't mean that there are past lives. See what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, in reference to Christianity, the wisdom of, of God is everywhere in the universe. And you find it in, uh, in different traditions using different kinds of symbolism and different kinds of language. Right. For example, in the Eastern Orthodox, because I've spent the next um, 20 years studying Eastern Orthodoxy, Oh. And I found that you'll find a lot of common ground between Eastern Orthodoxy and the mystical traditions of the East. Uh, right. It doesn't mean that they are all uh, the same. Uh, they have differences. They we like uh, a different language. Right. We can talk about love, but we use different kind of words coming from different kinds of languages. Right. For example, in Taoism, there is the statement that. Um, the Tao that can be named is not the real Tao, right? right. In Christianity, there is the saying of uh, Evagrius of Pontus. I think he was in the 14th century. Uh, the God that can be named is not the real God. Okay. Right? So this is just a, a simple... Um, uh, so I think we live at a time in history where we are no longer divided by mountains and deserts that um, prevented contact on a mass scale between different civilizations. And now living in a multicultural universe, we are forced to acknowledge uh, the spirituality of other people in other traditions. Right. And some academics uh, and some theologians and scholars try to see the interface between them because right. we really need to develop a new worldview that will save us from ourselves, from self-destruction. Right. And, and uh, since we are on the subject of Eastern uh, spirituality, so here we see a lot of, um, you know, associated with spiritual people, there's a lot of facade, you know, a certain way of living, a certain way of renunciation, a certain way of dressing, you know, uh, and some moral codes. But then by all, uh, you know, all your account, it looks like, Daskalos or the people around him were just regular people, like government employees living on a pension. He was just an amiable old grandpa, as it were, and he had a regular life. And yet, there was like a curious uh, confluence of the the arcane and the mundane. So, without any trappings of you know external facade. So, do you think like do you have any views on this? Like how? Well, that's, that's very, very well put. The people that I was studying were lay mystics, let's put it this way. Uh, they lived ordinary lives, but they also lived in another world at the same time, like Daskalos did. I haven't ve met very many people who are like Daskalos. I think he was just very unusual. Uh, but um, I also spent the next 20 years studying monks and hermits on Mount Athos. Right. Um, the, the mountain of silence uh, is is that kind of work. Right. I don't talk about reincarnation in in my field research there, but the essence of uh, uh, the spiritual life and what you need to do uh, to overcome the uh, the um, this form of reductionism uh, and also to develop to higher levels. Of awareness, uh, there there are similarities with Hinduism and Buddhism. Right. Of course, if you tell the monks on Mount Athos about these things, they'll tell you, no, 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 we are unique. And, well, I understand that because if you if you do not have any contact with anybody else, then you assume that your way is the only way, right. uh, and it is a way. It is a, a very uh, a very legitimate way. Is uh, bhakti yoga right. in Hinduism? Uh, yes. Ayana Buddhism in, uh, in, in Tibetan. So um, I, um, we have to be patient in terms of these things. And uh, I learned how to accept differences without uh, getting confused. Let's put it this way. Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, since you mentioned Mount Athos, um, I want to talk about that also uh, briefly, but before that, just quickly going back to uh, Daskalos. Uh, have you ever wondered or looked into how a lay person like him came to acquire these powers? 
And is there some is there some method? I know you did describe some methods and exercises uh, yeah. in your books. I, I, I mean, based on what he told me about himself, he brought them with him in this life. When he was young, he thought that everybody was like him. And he was talking about uh, meeting spirits and people from the other dimensions. And his mother... Um, told him to shut up because people would think he's crazy and lock him up in a mental asylum. Right. So then he realized that he was not uh, sharing something that everybody shares. Right. So he, um, and, and he didn't have a great reputation in a very uh, traditional society. They thought he was weird. They thought he was uh, a charlatan. If, if they were, if you were a very uh, secular, you consider him a charlatan. If you are very religious, you, uh, they consider him uh, instrument of the devil. So it was not an easy life from that point of view. Right. Uh, uh, so uh, yes, the um, uh, Daskalos was not typical of Eastern Orthodox people. Right. Uh, but uh, I found common uh, experiences that he had with Native American medicine men, for example and some of the Eastern yogis. Now he himself told me that the person that offered him, uh, I didn't write about this, that when he was uh, young, during the Second World War, there was a contingent of Indian troops that came to the island because Cyprus was under British control and India was under British control. And he got a message from a surgeon to meet him, who came with the Indian company, the, the Indian uh, troops. And he was a surgeon, uh, but uh, he was also a, um, a master, a spiritual master. Okay. So he, he claims that he did, uh, taught him a lot of things and he initiated him into the inner tradition. So there is wow. this connection with India. Right. And I believe, uh, I think you mentioned this in the Magus of Strollos that. Uh, he also did mention that he is a re he used to be a, a yogi in a former life among many other reincarnations. Yeah, he told me about previous lives that he claims he had, and he spoke about them with uh, in, in great detail. Uh, and he uh, he would say that one should not try to uh, trigger past memories because that can create problems for for the person. It can bring memories in the, from the past that you are not ready to handle them in this life. And that can lead to some kind of schizophrenia. So he was very careful not to, 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 uh, to advise against trying to trigger past memories. Because the fact that you don't, those memories are in your subconscious. And what you are now, he claimed, is the sum total of the experiences you had in the past. So if you, if you trigger those memories, everything will, will be rushing into your present consciousness and that can create serious problems for you. Right. That's, what, that's what he was saying. Okay, now speaking of these experiences that you saw, of course, there were those that you personally witnessed when you were meeting him. And of course, there are stories and accounts that you heard from him, which, you know, obviously as an academic, there is no way, you can only report, there is no way for anyone to verify. So we'll leave yes. that aside. But of those that you personally witnessed, is there anything that stands out as completely mind-blowing? Could you recount to us maybe one or two such instances? Well, I mentioned one uh, when a woman from New York had serious uh, medical problems and the doctors could not uh, identify what the problem was. And uh, her husband asked me if I could take a picture to Daskalo, see if he can identify what the problem is. So I was always open to see how he would respond to these kinds of provocations. So I took the picture when I, uh, on a, during the summer when I went to the island and he closed his eyes and wrapped the picture like this. And he said, the problem of this woman is in, are, are in her teeth, her, teeth are all infected and she should go and uh, take care of them at the dentist. So uh, I thought it was far-fetched, but I wrote the letter to these people and this is what Daskalo said. So when I came back 
I got a call in my office after a few weeks from the same person. And he said, do you remember the case? I said, yes, I do remember it. Um, and he said, when we got your letter, we thought it was nonsense. We, we threw it away. And I said to him, well, I don't blame you. And he said, no, you don't understand. Um, after a few days, the front teeth of my wife exploded and infectious pus was dripping from, from the holes. Wow. And then he went to, she went to a dentist and they took care of her because her whole teeth were all infected. Now, what is the probability of, of, of this uh, diagnosis to be right on the mark, right? right? And I've, I've heard other things. Uh, we don't have the time to go into these details. But another thing that really impressed me was when a friend of mine asked me if I didn't mind taking the, uh, bringing Daskalos to a, um, a woman um, who was suffering from her spine. And the doctors gave up on her. She went to Israel nearby and the doctors at the university told her that there was no, no solution to her problems and uh, she would have to spend most of her life in bed. So she was desperate, the poor woman. So uh, I described that in the Magus of Stavros, uh, right. in the chapters. We are in a matter of uh, 25 minutes, he stroked her back, barely even touching it. And um, she told her she, she is healed now. So she stood up and she exercised, she did. Uh, and he said, oh my God, I haven't been able to do these things. So she couldn't believe it herself. She went to her radiologist and uh, took uh, x-rays and the x-rays showed a normal spine. The x-rays that she had from before a weeks ago, a uh, couple of weeks ago, showed a problematic spine. I took the two x-ray sets to a doctor friend of mine and I he told me that this shows a normal spine and this shows a very problematic spine. So that was also earth shaking for me among many other incidences of clairvoyance. Have, have uh, you had any of your personal problems solved miraculously? Have you had any personal experiences of healing with him? Well, the only personal thing that we had was uh, when we came back from Cyprus after nine months. When you say uh, we, you mean you and your wife? You, my, my, yes. Okay. Uh, my wife had a problem on, with her knee. And she couldn't, uh, she couldn't uh, be in a car and bend it. She had to have it straight. So I kept telling her to go to the doctor. And she, um, she, she procrastinated. And then suddenly we get a letter from Cyprus. And Daskalos, uh, Daskalos assistant there, uh, one of his disciples, said that Daskalos noticed that Emily has a problem with her right knee. We recommend that she goes to a doctor and take care of it. Wow. We will do our best from here, but she should see a doctor. Wow. Well, she didn't see a doctor because in a few days, the problem went away. So is that coincidence? I let you decide. The other thing, I, I, I took Daskalos to, uh, I took a, uh, a couple uh, a European ambassador and his wife to Daskalos. And uh, I asked him to, uh, I mean, they, they, they had problems with, um, with their health and the doctors could not identify it. So he said, uh, the, there is a virus in your, uh, in your uh, intestines that uh, you got from a previous uh, assignment in Japan and Turkey. They got together, he said, and the virus is there. It cannot be detected by any instrument, right. but I'll give you a concoction and that will wash it away. In 10 days, the virus faded away. So those were direct kind of things that I saw. Well, no, I mean, it was not done on me, right. but it was done on Emily. Right. Um, I, I did have a problem with my knee one time and... Uh, and he rubbed it and the pain went away. So it's nothing extraordinary compared to the things that I have witnessed on others. Wow. Uh, but there is definitely, I mean, uh, statistically speaking, obviously it clearly makes sense. Like what are the odds of these things happening? Like it can't be a coincidence, I guess, at least to a common person's mind. Yeah, so, I mean, okay. If there is a coincidence, it will be a coincidence of winning the, uh, the, uh, 
the jackpot right. and maybe winning it two or three times in a row. Right. <laughs> Is that a coincidence? Is it a coincidence that brought this universe into existence? Right. So there's only one, there can only be one possible conclusion in that case. I, I have no doubt, I have no doubt that there are people cross-culturally who are gifted with disabilities. It's a matter of modern science to acknowledge it and direct its, uh, its methods in studying those phenomena. Right. And, and just uh, quickly, uh, just moving on from uh, Daskalos and Cyprus, I know that you've also been to Greece and Mount Athos and, and, and uh, you know, met the monks there. Uh, which you speak about in Mountain of Silence. Now, what is it? What, what is this about? Like, because all around the world, and even in India, there is a concept of uh, sacred mountains. You know, mountains uh, uplifting people, mountains associated with spirituality, both in Hinduism and Buddhism. So, why? I mean, I'll, I'll let the viewers look up Mount Athos and and the monasteries there themselves. They can do the background check. But why do you think? Mount Athos is special, and why do you think mountains and in general have that special character of spirituality? Well, I mean, for the last um, 1500 years, Mount Athos has been a place of spiritual practice, continuous prayers, and so on. So, using uh, energetic um, theory, there is a lot of concentration of good energy there that causes miracles to take place. Uh, this is what, um, what the monks experience uh, on an ongoing basis. At least this is what they tell me. And I've met monks who, uh, from different kinds of, uh, of backgrounds. Monks who uh, just finished elementary school all the way to university professors who gave up their academic positions and ended up on Mount Athos doing spiritual work. So the mountain was set up in the ninth century by the emperor of Constantinople because the monks and the hermits from the Middle East were being pushed out of those areas because of the expansion of Islam. So they came to Mount Athos to continue their spiritual work. Right. And over the centuries, they created a tradition based on the gospel on the basic principles of Christianity. And uh, for me, it was another revelation because as um, I met Father Maximus, who for me uh, was a new stage in my development in the sense that I realized that there is a mystical kind of Christianity within the organized church. Uh, and it was fascinating. Also, I realized the, the person who invited me to join him on Mount Athos was a friend of mine who said to me, if you want to meet uh, real saints, why don't you come with me to Mount Athos? And I, I did go there. I, I was reluctant to go because I was prejudiced against, uh, against organized uh, religion, against organized Christianity. So if the 60s turn, turned me into an agnostic, the 70s, uh, led me to question my skepticism, to be skeptical of my skepticism. The 80s was the discovery of Daskalos and his world. Uh, then the 90s, when I met Father Maximus, I realized that the spiritual traditions are wa uh, well uh, and well uh, established on places like the monasteries of Mount Athos. So for the last 20 years, I've been studying that. Right. Uh, using the same methodology. And I wrote The Mountain of Silence. I wrote uh, Gifts of the Desert, uh, Inner River, right. starting with uh, Riding with the Lion. That, that was the turning point when I started meeting, uh, encountering Mount Athos. Right. I, um, I, I wrote this in my latest book. It just came out, The Accidental Immigrant, okay. a, quest for, a Quest for Spirit in a... Uh, in a skeptical age. So it just came out in case somebody in your audience may want to take a look at it. You can right. find uh, information also on Amazon. Okay, the I'll, I'll put a link to that in my description on the channel. Yeah, I don't know if I thought I had a question. Yeah, fine. And, and uh, lastly, do you think 
people like these mystics and healers uh, exist now in Cyprus? Or is that a tough question uh, to answer? Well, Father Maximus is in Cyprus. Okay. And he brought a renaissance of monasticism on the island. He created several monasteries there. Every time I go, I go and spend uh, some time with um, with the monks there. And it's very it's very helpful for people who live in the world to withdraw sometimes and spend a few days in a monastery. Right. And just like as it is in India, I assume. Right. Exactly. So, uh, so yes, there are people in Cyprus. I. I haven't met anybody who is like Daskalos. But, but are uh, you uh, uh, academically still active? Are you still investigating these on a personal uh, capacity? Or uh, where is your personal journey taking you now? Are you still in this world or do you have other interests? Well, I will welcome any opening to the other worlds. <laughs> I am just looking at it from uh, as, as a sympathetic outsider. Right. But I am no longer uh, affiliated with a university. I just got uh, retired. So I am Professor Emeritus now. Okay. And I have the luxury of doing whatever I like in terms of reading books and writing whatever I want to write without being concerned about, about it. That's, and that's how I wrote uh, The Accidental Immigrant because it's, it's the summing up of my work. So I hope maybe now you find time to perform some of those exercises on your own and do some yeah. you know, miracles. Well, on your I, own. I do. I do try to do some spiritual work, always inadequately. Yes. I am. I. Uh, I am not uh, as good as I should. Let's put it this way. <laughs> right. But I hope. I hope. Right. So on that note, thank you so much, sir, for uh, having a chat with me. It was wonderful. And, and I'll put a link in the description for your latest book. And, uh, and thanks so much and have a nice day. Thank you. I, I, can, send you, uh, I can send you a little uh, code, um, statement with the front and back page of, right. the, uh, of the book. Well, thank you, Ramesh. I really appreciate it. It was nice talking to you. Thank you so much. And, Likewise. Uh, and enjoy your program. Uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, very good. Carry on. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye.